Good evening, everyone. It's a blessing to be able to gather here together with you this evening to take some time to open up God's Word and study together from it. We'll be looking this evening at just some, a really, really a very simple sermon. We'll only hit a couple scriptures this evening, starting there in Acts chapter 8, if you'd like to open up your Bibles and follow along with me. There in Acts chapter 8, just looking at some simple godly attitudes that I think it's good times for us every once in a while to sit back, to reflect. And while a deeper character dive, like we kind of did this morning, looking at Elijah, looking at the different aspects of his life, the good, the bad, the things that he excelled at, and the things that he struggled in, I think it's also good just to take some simple sermons like this tonight, hit and look at some biblical examples and just boil down in the simplest way we can explain what are some of the greatest lessons that we can take from men and women like this. I want to start there with Philip in Acts chapter 8. We've had whole sermons on Acts chapter 8, whether that be with Saul persecuting the church, whether that be with Simon the sorcerer, whether it be with the Ethiopian eunuch. We've had sermons on Philip, starting there in Acts chapter 6, looking at his life and where he ends up from before the Ethiopian eunuch and even after the Ethiopian eunuch. But I think really if you could boil it, Philip down into one word, I would just say he's an enthusiastic man. He's a man that every time God gave him an inch, every time God or the apostles gave him something to do, he took that and ran with it. And I think it's best embodied there in Acts chapter 8 there in verse 30. The angel of the Lord had spoken to Philip, told him, arise, go towards Gaza. And he hears something. As he's going down the road, he hears a man sitting in a chariot reading aloud from Isaiah the prophet for himself and for his entourage that are traveling with him. When he hears this, the Spirit of the Lord said to Philip in verse 29, go near and overtake this char chariot. So Philip ran to him, heard him reading from the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? I was just having a conversation with my mother-in-law in the car here on the way here. Sometimes I get enthusiastic, especially when talking about God's Word. Sometimes I get a little bit too enthusiastic and speak a little bit too quickly. My wife usually gives me a look. Oh, down. <laughs> whether that be in Bible class or whether that be in the sermon. But this is an attitude that I think we do need to have to a certain extent. Yes, there are times we got to reel it back, maybe when talking with people or preaching or teaching, so that folks can understand what we're saying, absolutely. But I love Philip's enthusiasm here. He's walking along, and you don't get an opportunity like this very often. You don't get opportunities, and we even saw one very similar to this a couple weeks ago. Tony and his wife and his family show up last week. They show up, and I want to be baptized. It's not often someone just kind of appears on your lap and is asking questions, what do I need to do in order to be saved? What do I need to do in order to understand God's Word so that I can follow what I need to follow? Usually, we're having to try and talk and convince folks to even let us sit down and study with them or to convince folks to come to church. There might be some things that you need to hear. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Here is an opportunity that we may not see very often but when we do, do we have the enthusiasm to fill it? Here is not just someone I'm passing by and I'm starting the conversation about spiritual things. They're already involved with it. Whether that be at the Tuesday evening or Saturday morning Bible studies that we have going on. We've had men and women approach us and ask questions. I'm thankful to say of the men and women that were there and joined us, they were enthusiastic and talking and excited to talk about those things. When folks come in the door, we should be enthusiastic to talk to them, to get to know them at services. When we have opportunities and see a door opened in the workplace, family gatherings, in the neighborhood, as we find opportunities, are we excited like men like Philip were? We're run, we're jumping while the iron is hot so that we can take advantage of this opportunity for God's name to be magnified or do we close it up? I don't have time for this. It's too embarrassing. I don't want to go forward. I don't want to approach this any more than I have to. 
we walk away and lose an opportunity that might save a soul. Imagine what would have happened if Philip heard this and said, yeah, that looks like a real fancy chariot. That looks like a lot of people that are with him. This looks like an important fellow. He's already reading the scriptures. He doesn't need me. I'm just going to keep on going. The Holy Spirit told me to go towards Gaza. The Ethiopian eunuch might never have been saved. The gospel might not have spread near as quickly back to Ethiopia. We don't know the ramifications of not only what the Ethiopian eunuch lived the rest of his life doing, but what he did with the gospel. If he's the man that I see in this example, he probably spread that when he went back home. We never know how much and how far the gospel can go. But if we're not enthusiastic when we get the opportunity, it's not going to get beyond our lips. In fact, it may shrivel up and die when it comes to us. What we see with Philip is that enthusiasm paid back. By the time they sit down, they study, they discuss Isaiah, they discuss how that ties into Jesus Christ, the Messiah, this man that just recently died, this man that Philip has been going about, this Messiah, this Son of God, that Philip has been going about and talking about. Finally, in verse 37, the Ethiopian eunuch See, here is water. I'm sorry, verse 36. See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? In verse 38, so he commanded the chariot to stand still. Both Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. That enthusiasm also ultimately culminating in the Ethiopian eunuch having his soul saved and him going away from this interaction rejoicing. I think sometimes we come across afraid, and I do too, I know sometimes it may seem like I'm a bull in a china shop when I get an opportunity, and my wife can definitely attest to this. Sometimes I bust through all social barriers and act like I don't see them. Sometimes I still get scared, though, too. But sometimes we got to rush through the social barriers, the social norm that, hey, someone random is approaching the cart and is asking biblical questions. What's he doing here? Maybe he's probably got guards with him if he's a eunuch in the court of Queen Candace. I don't know whether the guards tried to push him away and tell him no. What did the end result of that enthusiasm result in, though? Verse 39. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. He was glad that the puzzle pieces in life finally started to fit together. Why am I here? What is my purpose? What does life ultimately culminate in? What's the purpose of me existing? Is it to get up to work, to eventually just die, and that's the end? Or is there something more? All that and more was answered by just starting a conversation. By being excited to talk about the gospel. There's a lot we could say about Philip, but just that attitude alone is enough if you take anything away from that. Take away that enthusiasm. Take that attitude that I want to be enthusiastic and I want to leap on the opportunity. I don't want to just, just want to say I'm enthusiastic. I want to show that I am enthusiastic when I take opportunity to share the gospel. Sometimes it'll result in a door getting slammed in our face. Sometimes it will result in people going, Back off. You're weird. Go away. I don't want to talk to you. It's just going to happen. I have brethren that react that way when they see me coming sometimes and wanting to talk about something. You're definitely going to get it from strangers. My own wife looks at me like that sometimes when I get off on a spiritual tangent and when I start talking about something or whether it be something spiritual, whether it be something nerdy that I start talking about and I see the eyes glaze over and okay, I guess it's time to stop. But that enthusiasm is infectious. It does result in good news and the best news being shared with those around us. Let us take those things and let us put it to use. On a similar type of idea, let us take the zeal of Isaiah and put it to use. We think of Isaiah in probably as bad or worse of a society than Elijah that we talked about this morning. 
Isaiah isn't Elijah and causing no rain to come upon the kingdom for three and a half years. Elijah definitely wasn't popular for doing that, at least in the time. In hindsight, Elijah was popular. In the moment, he was not popular. How much worse do you think they looked upon Isaiah in his day? When he's the one that has to bring the news, you're about to go into captivity for 70 years. Many of you are about to be slaughtered for your lack of faith because you have dis dismayed the Lord one too many times. I don't know about you, I'm not excited to preach fire and brimstone sermons. They're not the most fun to preach. I do like to nerd out about history. I do like to talk about grace. I do like to talk about the sacrifice of Christ or delve into a chapter or a biblical story. I love that. But the fire and brimstone and the hard subjects, that's a little bit hard to get excited about. But the Isaiah that I see in Isaiah chapter 6, while he maybe wasn't excited about everything that he was about to preach, I don't think he fully realized what he was going to preach by the time of Isaiah chapter 6. But in Isaiah chapter 6, he gets an opportunity. God speaks to Isaiah and reveals himself to Isaiah basically tells him, I have work that needs to be done. Who will do the work? Let's read Isaiah chapter, there, chapter 6, beginning there in verse 8. Also, Isaiah writes, I heard a voice from the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I answered, Here am I, send me. We sing that song, I believe it's number 81 in our songbooks. I'm here, I can do the job. I have just seen this vision of you coming down, of me saying, what was me? I am a man of unclean lips. Of you sending an angel to touch a stone to my lips and saying that I've been purified. Why shouldn't I be appreciative of that and now zealous that my sins are washed away? I am purified. I am standing before the Lord my God and He says, I need work to be done. Who will volunteer? That's why we often see new converts being very zealous, very excited. Give me a job. G give me a task. Give me something to do. I'm on fire. I want to do something. How can I help? Isaiah was very much that person in Isaiah chapter 6. And God gave him much to do. Isaiah was zealous because he truly appreciated and understood it was fresh in his memory just what God had done for him. Back up there to verse 7 like we were talking about. One of the seraphim flew to me, that being Isaiah, <clears throat> having in his hand a live coal which he had taken from, with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is purged. You hear news like that, you see men and women come up out of the water. You very often see me hugging them. My dress clothes will drop. The chlorine will wash out. It's fine. I'm excited and they're excited. We're rejoicing that a soul has been saved. I try not to come on too strong <laughs> when someone comes up out of the water and wanting to sit down and study with them and talk with them, but I also want to strike while the iron is hot. We try not to come off too strong and bombard the new person with everything, but we do want to strike while that iron is hot, while they're still zealous and excited to fan the flame. Are we zealous to try and fan the flame in one another, even those of us who have been Christians for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years? Has the zeal and the fire gone out or are we trying to build one another up? Because God's still calling. There's still work to be done here in the building for worship. There's still things to be done here with looking out for other members and helping one another. There's still things to do here in teaching classes and leading in prayer and leading in songs. There's still work to do in evangelizing. There's work to do in encouraging. There's work to do in writing cards and inviting people out. 
Are we as brethren or as elders and preachers going to different members and trying to ask them to do specific jobs? This role needs fulfilled. I think you'd be a good fit for that. Would you be interested in trying to help out? I think sometimes we need to take a step forward and try and help stoke that zeal. We need to let it be known. I think sometimes we get a little bit frustrated sometimes. We can see it in the home and other places, but especially in the church. We have this job and this job and this job, and it's not getting done, and I just keep adding more and more to my plate, and it feels like it's never going to get done. I've added another task in here. Are we letting people know it needs to be done? Maybe it was asked before. Are we asking again? I need help. There is a job that needs to be done. We need to sometimes give brethren an opportunity to say, here am I, send me. Don't let our zeal get crushed in thinking no one will answer the call. No one will be interested. You've got to realize, when is God making the call? There is work that needs to be done. Who shall I send? Who will go for us? He was sending out that call on the brink of Israel being led away into captivity because of how sinful and how far they had fallen. Sounds like the worst time to try and recruit a prophet among your own people. And who did he find? In the midst of that, he still found Isaiah. He still found someone that could appreciate what God has done for him. He still found someone that was excited to say, here and I, here am I, send me. That did not mean that Isaiah did not have his reservations. He did not have his concerns. He certainly did. Back up to verse 5. So I said, Isaiah writes, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When the vision first opens, his first reaction is, I'm not the person for the job. I'm not worthy to see the hosts of heaven crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. But God reassures him by sending the angel to touch his lips. God reassures him, I'm calling out. I need people to volunteer and step up and do the work. We can reassure one another that, okay, maybe you don't have much practice. Maybe you don't have much experience. Maybe you haven't done whatever job it may be very much. We're not asking you to be the best person to ever exist in song leading or teaching in Bible class or educating the lost. But we all start somewhere. We never know where it will eventually lead and go. The question is, do we ignore God's call and hope someone else will volunteer? Or do we have that same enthusiasm where you and I say, here am I, send me. I'm not waiting for other people to volunteer. I want to volunteer. I'm not waiting for someone else to step up and do the work. There is a role that needs fulfilled. I need to say to myself, and you need to say to myself, okay, what can I do? I need to go ask questions of my friends and neighbors, of the elders in the church, of those that are making the schedule, whoever it may be. What can I do to help? What do you need? What can I do that God's name be magnified instead of sitting around and waiting for someone else to do the work? If there's anything you take from Isaiah, it's that we should take away his zeal. If there's anything that you take away, I think, from Job, I think it's that we need to trust in God. Turn with me back to Job chapter 13. Again, we've talked about Job before. There's a lot that we have said about Job. There's a lot more we could say about Job. But what fascinates me most about Job isn't the beginning or the end of the book. It's everything there in the middle. It's everything that his friends and his wife try to do to convince him to give up on God. There are certainly lessons in endurance and in pain, in loss, and in grief in the book of Job. 
what I love most about Job is how much he trusts in God. Passages like Job 13 and verse 15, where Job answers back his friends, though he, that being God, slay me, even if he kills me on the spot, yet I will trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. Job says there is a part about being a servant of God that at the end of the day, it has to come down to, do I trust my God? That does not mean I sit there and take everything that the world has to throw at me. I can still plead my case. I can pray to my God. I can ask for answers. I can ask, why me? Why am I in this situation? Why are these things have, happening to me? I can still plead with God to change my situation, my sickness, my heartache, whatever it may be, but still at the end of it, even if He decides, no, your life is done. It's time to take it away from you. With that utmost trust, I can still talk to Him in the after a while. Why did all this happen to me? Why am I the one that was chosen to be assaulted by Satan in such a vicious manner? I don't see it. Can you explain it to me? While still trusting, God is looking out for my best interest. He does still care about me and my soul. Job trusted in God's promise that there would be something better waiting after him. There would be something better coming that was more than the pain and the robbery and the death and the sickness that he had been going through in just the last couple of days. Job 14 and verse 14, If man dies, he shall live again. All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. I know what so many people struggle with. That there is a purpose to being here. There is more to life than just waking up, going to work, coming home, eating, going to bed, and repeat. While that does make up a large part of our life, Job says, I trust that there is something greater here for not only me to do on this earth, there's something waiting me better in a home that God has prepared. Job saw that trust rewarded here on this earth. Job 42, we won't read the whole account, but one of many things that gets restored, the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. He had more children and everything else that came along later. His life was still blessed. It was blessed greater on this earth than it was before Satan came after him. But the part of it that I have a hope in Job that's more important than the physical stuff God rewarded him with was I think Job was more excited when his life ended and he's there with Abraham and others most likely waiting for judgment day. Even on the best of days when the kids and the grandkids came around when all the female servants and male servants, the sheep, the, doc, the donkeys, the oxen, the camel, even though those were all around, those were multiplied greater than they were before, there were still bad days even after this point. There were still body aches. There were still growing older. There was still heartache. I'm sure there was still loss of loved ones. There were still hard times that would hit Job after this. I don't think anything to the same level of what Satan sent him in Job chapter 1 and 2. But there would still be hard days. But as much as God blessed him on the earth, there was something greater waiting for him. Will I trust God, will I trust God like Job did? No matter what adversity may come, no matter how hard today or tomorrow may be, will I place my trust in him that he will help me through this? Will I have a determination? Will you have a determination like Joshua? I think we just did read through Joshua not that long ago, but I think it's always important to hit upon this note. It's something I probably look at daily in my house because we have a couple plaques 
with this verse. Some of them my own grandfather carved hanging in my house right now. As for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua's determination. I can't even imagine what he's going through. Having lived about 90 or so years watching the children of Israel go from complaining in Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, whining in the wilderness, building a golden calf, rebelling over and over, the earth being opened up and swallowing a rebellious generation, serpents being sent by God, poisoning the people, a sickness and a plague swiping through the people so fast Moses had to run and hold out his hand to halt it from going any further. The betrayal of the people saying, we can't take the promised land. Crossing the Jordan River without his mentor, Moses. Going to Jericho, and yes, winning great victories, but also facing great loss. When Achan brought sin into the camp. When he made his own foolish decisions as a leader, and relied on his own power rather than God. Seeing the sun stand still in the earth as he fought. Seeing fire and brimstone coming down from heaven. Watching a rebellious people as they're finishing conquering the land, not completing the job. Letting idolatry still slip into their midst. Joshua saw more wavering back and forth than I think you and I ever will in a church or in a nation. And still his final parting words were determined. You choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of the, which, uh, which your God, the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, the gods of the Amorite in whose land you dwell, but as for me, as for my house, as long as there is still breath in my lungs, he is pretty much say, we will serve the Lord. I can't control what the entire nation does, Joshua is saying. I can't even fully control what my own household is going to do. But as long as they have respect for me, as long as I am the head of my household, Joshua says, we will serve the Lord. You ever heard your parents growing up? You can do that when you get your own house. You can do that when you start your own family. As long as you're in my house, that won't be allowed. If you didn't hear it growing up, I sure did. It's that determination. I don't care what everybody else does. I know my parents heard that a lot because we had cousins whose parents were I would either say barely Christians or had left the faith entirely. That got to do a lot of things that teenage me, preteen me, was very jealous of. I asked a lot of questions why. I told my parents they're not as fun as my aunt and uncles multiple times. And they said that's okay. As for me in my house, I don't care what the cousins are doing, I don't care what your baseball team is doing. We're going to services. I guess you get to miss the tournament. I don't care the concerts that they're allowed to go to by themselves at 13 years old. You're not going. There's too much other stuff going on there. Not a safe place for a young teenager to be by themselves. As for me, as for my house, I very much heard that growing up. We're going to serve God to the best of our ability. Do we have that same determination? Joshua challenged the people. Verse 19 down through verse 21. You cannot serve the Lord God, for He is holy. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods then he will turn and do harm and consume you after he has done good. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. Yes, Joshua had a great task on his shoulder 
to lead the nation of Israel, and he tried his best. He even had to do the hard task of telling some of them, you're going to fail. And it's not because he's being pessimistic. It's because he's looking at how they're reacting right now. They're telling Joshua to his face, we will serve the Lord while still having idols back home in their house. He's telling some of the people, you will say that you're going to serve the Lord, but you are going to utterly fail because I know what's going on in your home right this second. Still, do your best. Try. As for me, I'm going to do the best with the most control that I can. As for me, first and foremost, I'm going to serve God. As for my household, I'm going to do my best to lead them, and I hope they follow suit. I hope they learn from my teaching and my example. As for the nation after him, he says, I hope you follow suit. But no matter what you decide, for me, God still comes first. Christianity is never going to be the most popular decision in our schools, in our workplace, even sometimes in our own household, certainly not in our own country and in our own world. There's a lot of people that will blow anything and everything up to the extreme to avoid following God. Yet I still need to be determined like Joshua. There's a lot we could take from Joshua. If I take anything, I need to be determined like him. As for me and as my house, I don't care what the world says. I'm going to serve God and I'm going to try and help my family serve God to the best of my ability. One last example, this time in the New Testament. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. Again, there is so much we could talk about Paul, especially because he makes up a majority of the New Testament. We have a lot we could pull from. I like Philippians chapter 4. Because it's Paul who has been a Christian for quite a while at this point. He's gone through the good times of being a Christian. He's gone through the very bad times of being a Christian and an apostle and a preacher and a teacher. He's seen the ups and downs. In fact, he's facing very soon what is to most likely and what historic history points out to be the end of his life. Yet in spite of that, some of his final words are no matter what has come, it's taking a lot of the things that we talked about. Up until my final moments, I'm going to be enthusiastic. I'm going to be zealous. And I'm going to share that with those around me. We see that in the book of Philippians. I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to rely on God no matter what may come here. And I'm going to be determined. Whatever God decides, I will stick it out to the end. Because Paul realized on our own, the alternative because he lived part of his life that way. We're weak. We're without hope. The alternative is far worse. Read with me Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. Paul said, I've been in just about every scenario that you can imagine a man to be put in. Some that you can't imagine a man to be put in very easily. I've learned to be blessed and I've learned to be cursed. I've learned to have much and to turn around in the next month and have nothing and not know if I'm going to get another meal. I've learned to have a comfortable home for my head, and I've learned to sleep on a ship that's tossing in the storm and not sure if we're going to make it through the rest of this boat ride. I've learned to preach in front of a crowd of people that are excited and zealous just like I am. To worship and serve the Lord. I've been a part of churches, Paul is saying, like Philippi, that has been like a second family. 
with how close and how loving they are. And I have been in crowds that want to drag me in the street and stone me. In fact, some succeeded. Paul said, I have been in churches that have been divisive and bitter and was probably some of the worst days of the week for him. Yes, he went to go worship with God, but he had to be among brethren that despised each other, that were backbiting with one another, that hated one another, that were causing strife and false teaching, and he worshiped with brethren like that. He knew the good days and the bad days. Through it all, no matter how weak he may have been, no matter how much he may not have responded in the best ways some days to those situations, or may not have appreciated the good times when they were there, he said, on my own, I'm without help. I need God. I need Him to be faithful. First, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can overcome the bad days that are very hard. And my faith can be strengthened. I can learn to truly appreciate the good days and count my blessings rather than take them for granted. In all things, Paul said, I need God with me. I need Him to help me and I need Him to stand beside me. I need Him to help me get through these things. Verse 19 and 20 in the lesson is yours. And my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory ever and ever. Amen. And all these things, Paul said, being a student of God's Word, being an apostle, he remembered examples like probably some we talked about this evening and many more we could get to, but for the lack of time, we're not going. But in all things, there was common thread. God got Job, Isaiah, Joshua, Philip himself through all of these things. He increased their zeal their excitement, their willingness to work in the kingdom. No matter what the world around them might have said otherwise. Just a few attitudes I want us to try and take and hopefully put to use this week. We'll be more useful to God. We'll be more useful to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and helping sharpen one another as iron sharpens iron. And if you are here this evening and something has struck a chord that you need to obey the gospel, the water is ready. Let us help you. Come forward and confess, confess Christ is your Savior. Repent and be baptized and you can have your sins washed away. If you're here this evening and you are a Christian that has fallen short of what it means to serve God fully in His kingdom, then let's help make that right. Either privately in prayer, coming and speaking to one of us and asking for help, for guidance, for whatever it may be, or coming forward and confessing those things if it has brought shame upon the name of Christ. Whatever the case may be this evening, if the need calls for it, please come forward now. Together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.